Hello and welcome. My name is Francisco Cantu. And I'm David Cantu. And I'm very excited. We're both very excited because today we are doing a something completely different than what we do every week. We have been working really hard over the last few weeks to prepare a brand new presentation. Usually what we do in this live stream is we prepare something that is related to whatever is going on in the college admissions process. So something that's specific to, let's say, for in October, to the past, if we're in the summer, extracurricular. So something that relates to whatever is going on in the world of college admissions. However, today we have prepared a kind of a big overview presentation of the main points and some of the most relevant, insightful topics regarding the world of college admissions. So today's presentation that we have prepared for you all is on the top secrets to get accepted to college with scholarships. So it won't be about one particular topic in specific, but rather about a bunch of different topics that will help you not just get accepted to college, but it will also dive into the financing aspect of it. Again, we put a lot of research and a lot of preparation to this presentation. So we're both very, very excited to share with that, share that with you today. So if you can go ahead and let us know in the comments where you are watching us from. We just finished up the Spanish live stream. We did the same presentation, but in Spanish. And we had people from Tennessee, from California, from New York, from Florida, from Texas, all over the country. Uh, so it would be very nice to see where people are watching us from in the English channels, in the YouTube and the Facebook channels. So go ahead and let us know where you are watching us from and whether you are a parent or a student. The more you let us know and the more comments you make and the more dynamic we can make this live stream, number one, the more fun it will be for us because we can feed off your energy and the algorithm will push this forward and it will put it in front of more people who are interested or who this could be helpful for. Also, if you are a parent who is watching this and you have a bunch of Facebook friends who are also parents of middle school or high school students who this content could be helpful for, please do, do us a favor and share it. That will help us, again, reach um, the, more, the more people possible and the more people that we reach, the more that we can help out, the more questions we can get asked, and the more that we can make this a better experience for, for everyone involved. So do help us out with that. And if at any point you have any questions, go ahead and let us know in the comments. Yes, and if you do look, if you do see me looking at my screen, it's because I am answering questions and obviously moderating with you all. But yeah, the presentation today will be very useful. Um, the information that we shared earlier was super important for people. Uh, whether you are, and we'll go over this, who this training is for, but but yes, uh, let us know in the chat where you're joining from. And, and yeah, we can get started right away then. All right. Awesome. Awesome. So as I mentioned earlier, this presentation is on the top secrets to getting accepted to college with scholarships. And I want to make sure that everyone who is here knows that they're in the right place. So who is this presentation for? This presentation is for you. If you are the parent of a high school student who is confused about what you should be doing or to what degree you should be involved in this process, what your responsibilities are. This training is for you. If you're a student and you are looking to increase your odds of acceptance or you want to elevate the competitiveness of your college application, then this training is for you. You're in the right place. If you are the parent of a student who wants to go to college, but you are worried about how you're going to pay for it, this training is also for you if you're a student who is nervous about going into a lifetime of debt or who wants to learn how the financing process works, how you can avo avoid predatory loans, this is for you. Next up, if you want to learn exactly what colleges are looking for, that's probably, if not the top question we get asked, the most one of the top questions we get asked is what are colleges looking for or how can I stand out? Well, we're going to be covering that in a lot of depth today. And finally, this training is for you if you want to receive the best college aid possible. All right. So these are the, the, the prerequisites or what you should be asking yourself. If you fall into any of these categories, then you are in the right place. And next up, I want to go ahead and share with you some uh, one of two things that would bring you here or one of two goals that you might have. So everyone that we ever come in contact with regarding this process has one of or two of these goals, these two goals. They either want to get accepted to the best university possible. That is one of the two main components of the college application process, which is getting accepted. That's half the battle. And the challenge here is that 
the average college acceptance rate has been decreasing over the last few decades. Uh, in general, the admission statistics or the acceptance rate has gone from 71% in 2001 to 66% in 2017. And those seem like high numbers, which there are the true numbers for all universities across the U.S., but the more competitive that the university is and the more ambitious that your student is, the more significant these numbers become. So, for example, if we look at Harvard University, acceptance rate in 2003 was 10%, and now the latest acceptance rate was 3.19%. So, one of the two main goals is to get to college, and that is becoming increasingly difficult. And then the other question or the other goal that a student might have or that a parent might have is financing it. So, once you do get to college, how can you pay for it? All right. And paying for college becomes a challenge when you look at how the average cost of college, and we're going to go more in depth about this topic or into this topic uh, later on, but the average tuition and fees at private, non-for-profit, four-year universities went from $21,000 in 93 to almost $40,000 this last year, right? So about doubling in cost. And if you look at public schools, it went from $4,000 to $10,000. So again, the two main points here is how do you get into the best university possible? especially when it's becoming increasingly hard to get into college? And how do you pay for colleges when they are becoming increasingly expensive? So that is what we're going to be tackling today. And speaking of what we will be discussing today, there are seven main things that we will be teaching you or that we will be covering in further depth in this presentation, all right? So the seven main things that you'll learn today or the seven secrets that you will learn today is... First of all, how your student can get in the top 10% of the graduating class, how to earn a top 1% SAT or ACT score, the number one thing colleges are looking for, how to write a perfect college essay, and then the last thing that we're going to be learning regarding the application process is how to get recognized, so how to have the regional admissions officers uh, identify you when they're reviewing your application. So those first five tips will be related to admissions, and then the last two are going to be related to financing college. So the Sixth tip that we are going to be discussing is how to earn the best college aid uh, when it comes to financing. And then the last one is going to explore the easiest scholarships to win. All right. So that is a quick overview of the seven main things that we'll be learning today. All right. So before we get started, I want to first give a quick introduction as to who I am, and then I'm going to get right into the tips. But why you should why should you even listen to me? All right. So my name is Francisco Cantu. I am a UNC Chapel Hill graduate. I studied business there. Graduated um, graduated uh, in 2021, and I am one of the co-founders of Best College Aid. So I'm going to be introducing myself in three main dimensions. Number one, my high school experience. Then I'm going to go on to my college experience and what we have been doing over the last few years, just so that you understand kind of the credentials and why you should be listening or what you should be taken away from my experience and what we have done to help students. So first of all, let's talk about my high school experience. I was top 5% and a lot of people always ask about statistics and want to understand and see what other students were doing. So in the spirit of complete transparency, when I was in high school, I was the 20th. I was ranked 20th of a, of a class of around 435 students, which is of uh, top 5%. I was um, captain of the swim team. I swam my entire life. I knew that if I went to college, uh, and I needed swimming to pay for it, then I would do it. But if I could get to college without requiring swimming as a means to, to finance it, then I wouldn't do it. So I didn't go to college for swimming. I was able to afford it without it. So I quit swimming, but throughout my entire life, I was uh, a swimmer. I was uh, in student government. I was a class president for three years. I was in National Art Society. I was the vice president uh, my senior year. And my test statistics is that I had a 30 on the ACT. So it's a good score, nothing out of this world. Uh, so I would say I was uh, uh, a little bit above average of an applicant, but certainly we've worked with students who are significantly better applicants, students who are not necessarily uh, as good applicants. But again, in the spirit of transparency, those were my credentials in high school. However, understanding the process, I was able to get accepted to UNC Chapel Hill in North Carolina, the University of North Carolina. And before <clears throat> deciding to go there, 
throughout all the different universities that I got accepted to in the financial aid and scholarship awards offered. I had around $1 million being offered to me in financial aid and in scholarships across all the different um, sources. And as I mentioned, I graduated from the Keenan Flagler Business School, where I received around $220,000 in scholarships. Again, out of the 1220000 were specifically from UNC, where I ultimately ended up going. I was able to study abroad while I was in college. I went to a semester in Paris. It was a semester right before uh, everything shut down from COVID. So that was wonderful because I got the full study abroad experience and I didn't have to pay for it because my financial aid and scholarships covered everything. And within the organization or within college, there are two types of uh, Greek life organizations. There are social fraternities and there are academic ones. I was the president of UNC's academics uh, honor fraternity. And those were my main experiences in college. And then upon graduation, after um, reaching the end of my college career, I was offered my dream job at Cisco, uh, one of the largest tech companies in the world. And pretty much they told me that my life would be solved and I wouldn't have to worry at least for the foreseeable future because it was a very tempting offer. But instead, I chose to come back home and work on Best College Aid with my family. And that is something that we had started while I was still in college, but it became a full-time endeavor when I uh, graduated from UNC. And now, if you are watching this, maybe you came from this through our TikTok channel, our Instagram reels, our YouTube channel, Facebook. We have been blessed enough to reach millions of people through our social media content. And furthermore, through our Best College Aid Premium Program, we have thousands of students who we have helped. And many of them have reached significantly better results than I ever did at getting accepted to top colleges, to Harvard's, to the UPenn's, to the Stanford's, the University of Florida, the uh, the Northwestern's, the Georgetown's of the world. So wonderful universities with perfect, uh, all-encompassing financial aid award packages. All right. So that's been my experience over the last few years. That is who I am. And I am excited to get into these steps with you all. And yeah, I mean, as a family, we are siblings. We all earned over half a million dollars in aid and scholarships, like Francisco mentioned. And now that's what we do full time here at Best College Aid. So if you're a parent, if you're a student, let us know again uh, where you're joining from, uh, the grade that your student's in, so that we can, you know, be, make this more engage, engaging. And, and yeah, the, the tips that we will share now, starting with the first secret, will be of a lot of value to you all. And the first strategy that we want to share with you today, Francisco, you want to take it away? Yes. First thing that we're going to be covering is how your student can get in the top 10% of their high school graduating class. So let's start with a little bit of context as to why this matters. Well, first, why do colleges even care about class ranks? Well, class ranks, for those of you that don't know, class ranks are determined by looking at the grade point average, the the, the student scores, what they get on each of the classes that they take. It's get, it gets calculated into a GPA. And the higher the GPA, the better the class rank. So pretty, pretty standard calculation there. Um, and the reason why colleges care about it is because it represents the academic performance of the student throughout four years or even five or six years if they took high school level classes in middle school. And it gives an indication as to how the student performs over an extended period of time. Another thing that it does is it highlights how the student performs in the context of a homogeneous or a similar group of students who are all under the same characteristics. Typically, they have the same socioeconomic backgrounds. They have the same teachers teaching those classes. They have the same resources, the same libraries, because they are, they're all part of the same community. And another reason why colleges care about class ranks is that it is a strong indicator of their eventual college performance. So when we were preparing for this presentation, we were gathering information and we came across this 2013 study that was done in Texas. It pretty much looked at the statistics and the relationship between high school students' class ranks and their performance in college. So what it found was that students who were in the top 10% of their high school graduating class, and these statistics, these findings were the same for multiple schools across different levels of funding and different types of high schools from different um, areas and socioeconomic backgrounds. But on average, 
around 60% of the students who were in the top 10% of their high school graduating class had above a B average in college. All right, so that is very significant because it proved to be a very strong indicator of how a class rank can relate to a student's to a student's college performance. All right, so super, super important. And that is something that I wanted to share to lay out the context of why high school class ranks matter or why they consider it in the college application process. So now that you know why it matters, let's go ahead and look at the easiest way that a student can go ahead and enter the top 10% of their high school class. So as I mentioned, high school class rank determines the student's academic performance. So whether they got uh, a B, an A, a C, a D, whatever score they got in a class and how that plays into the context of a 4.0 scale GPA. However, Colleges or, or high schools, rather, take AP classes, IB classes, dual enrollment classes, advanced level classes as, as a whole, and they scale them on a higher scale. So instead of being scaled on a 5.0 scale rather than a 4.0 standard, AP classes go ahead and have a higher ceiling. So if you are a student who is worried about how they can elevate the, the level of competitiveness of their GPA. Well, not a shortcut, but a, an easy way to go about this is to take classes that allow you to have a higher ceiling. And that, again, would be the case with AP classes. So to make this a very concrete uh, tip or methodology that we teach our students inside Best College Aid, basically your honor classes or, or your students should be taking honors classes as the baseline um, Typically, to become a very competitive applicant, your students should really avoid to take regular classes unless they really, really, really struggle with the material. But for the most part, if your student puts in the work, they should be fine with a baseline of honors level courses. And then start taking advanced levels, so AP classes, IB classes, dual enrollment classes, on the subject matters that they are interested in or that they excel at. And once they get comfortable with those classes, so for example, if your student wants to grow up and be a psychologist or your student is great at math or at um, statistics, then they can start taking AP Psych, AP Stats, AP Calc, whatever the case might be in those particular areas. And then as they begin to get more comfortable in those subject matters, go ahead and stack up those AP classes so that they can fill up their remaining of their schedule and they can have a very robust and competitive course load, all right? So that is a tip, but what happens, and a lot of people ask us, what happens if your high school doesn't offer many AP classes? We have a lot of students who struggle or who are worried that their high school doesn't offer enough AP classes, so they might not have a dual enrollment program and who are worried that they might fall behind the college application process. However, very, very important for you to know that colleges have access and they have an understanding of the classes that are offered by your high school. And this acts as a double-edged sword because if you're a student who is not taking AP classes because they feel as though their high school only offers three, four, or five different options, they're like, oh, well, it's not going to be a different if I don't take any because they offer, offer, offer so little. Well, that's going to reflect poorly because out of the limited amount of options, you didn't take what was available to you. So it's super important for you to know that colleges will look at your course load taken in the context of what was available to you, all right? They want to see students that within that, as I mentioned earlier, homogeneous group or environment, students who make sure to take advantage of every opportunity, opportunity as extensive or as limited as those opportunities are, all right? So that's the first thing that I wanted to cover with you all with regards to how to get in the top 10%. Now moving on to Another very important component of a college application process, and that is standardized testing, all right? SAT and ACT scores, how do you earn a top 1% SAT or ACT score, all right? So for some context, after COVID-19, a lot of schools became test optionals. A lot of schools took away the requirement to send in your SAT or ACT scores as part of a complete application. And now, 2023, or if you're watching this in the future, whatever the year might be, uh, a lot of schools have just adopted those test optional policies and maintained them because they and they, they enjoyed how uh, inclusive it was for students to no longer be restricted by taking these exams. And what this phenomenon kind of 
led to was that around, even though it's optional, and even though you don't have to submit your SAT or ACT scores to have a complete application, as of today, around 80% of students choose to submit their scores. So only 20% of students at test optional universities do not submit their uh, SAT scores, again, on a national average. And what does this mean? Well, this means that the 80% of students who do end up submitting those scores are typically students who look at the average scores at those universities. And if they're at that level or above, they end up submitting those scores. So naturally, what the, what does this do? Well, if it is an average of if, if an SAT or ACT score has, um, uh, if a school has an average ACT score of 30 and students can see that in order to become an average, an average applicant, they have to submit a score of 30 in the ACT or above, only students with those scores or higher will submit them. So it might bring the average up to 31, 32, whatever. And then naturally it's a self-fulfilling cycle of becoming more and more competitive. All right. So that is a phenomenon that has been rising over the next few years. Um, and I wanted to put that in the context of what we are seeing today. So here are two universities, the University of Notre Dame and the University of Virginia. And if you look first at Notre Dame, the University of Notre Dame, last year they had an applicant pool made up of students, 46% of which applied without an SAT or ACT score and 54% of which applied with an SAT or ACT score. So if you want to round up around 50-50, 50-50% of students submitted scores, and 50% of them submitted scores, 50% did not submit scores. But what happens when you look out of that whole pool, if you go a step further and you look at the ones who were accepted to the University of Notre Dame, the distribution dramatically shifts in which only 30% of the admitted students came from the pool of applicants who did not submit scores and 70% of them did submit scores in half. So what does this mean? That the admission rates for students at Notre Dame in the last admission cycles who applied with an SAT or ACT scores had an admissions rate of 22% and students who applied without it only had an 11% admissions rate, right? So almost double or around double uh, the admissions rate for students who submitted their scores. If you look to the University of Virginia, the distribution is even more significant, a little bit more significant. 42% of applicants did not submit their scores. 58% did. However, when you look at the admissions pool, 26% of admitted students did not submit their scores, while 74% of admitted students did in fact submit scores. Admissions, admissions rate for students with scores, 23%. Admissions rate without scores, 11%. What does this all mean? It's a lot of statistics, but if we want to summarize it, basically what this means is that is that although submitting SAT and ACT scores is optional, students who go ahead and apply with competitive and strong SAT and ACT scores are simply more likely to be accepted. So even though the SAT and ACT scores are optional, you are, it's not really optional to have a good score if you want to increase your odds of acceptance, all right? So now that we know that it's important, now that we know why it matters, let's go ahead and check how you can go ahead and enter that top 1% or how you can improve your SAT or ACT scores. And basically, the bottom line here is you want to prioritize quality of your studying over quantity of your studying. So the SAT and ACT have very predetermined and recurring formats, meaning that a lot of the math questions, for example, will follow the same structure, will follow the same type of of, 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 of yeah, question type and the same concepts. However, they might change a few of the words or a few of the, of the numbers. But if you understand the format of these exams, you are going to start to see patterns and you're going to understand what is worth knowing and what is not worth knowing. So what we teach our students is to use previous official SAT exams or ACT exams take them under realistic conditions. So wake up a Saturday morning really early. If you're not going to drink coffee the day of the exam or have breakfast the day of the exam, try to emulate those testing conditions. Then take the exam, score it, see the areas that you did not perform well in, and then go ahead and review it, but not just review it for the sake of, oh, I got this one wrong, but rather for the sake of understanding which type of questions, which concepts, whether it's 
not just the math section, but geometry. Was it algebra one? Was it algebra two? Was it um, whatever the case might be? If you can identify patterns or areas in which you underperformed from the official exams, then you can start to understand and try to teach yourself or use official study materials to strategically and through quality time work on those areas of opportunity. And again, if you do this enough times with enough previous previous materials, you're going to see patterns on your thought processes. If you are in the English section uh, getting some of the same questions wrong because you think that a word is conjugated a certain way or you think that some words are abbreviated a certain way, after enough failed attempts, you're going to start seeing noticing patterns of how some things are not right and how some things are correct. And this will be very worthwhile for you because it's one of the quickest ways to get a bunch of questions that you would have otherwise gotten wrong, getting them right. All right. And then the last thing is a lot of students cave under pressure when they take these exams for the first time. They don't know how to administer their time. They get nervous. They don't know how to um, go ahead and test and, and, and do the reading section, how to budget for question reading, then going back, then underlining certain things. So if you go ahead and get that first time pressure out of the way through a significant number of practice attempts with official materials, then you don't have to worry. All right. So again, to summarize this quality over quantity of your studying and the more official that the testing materials are, the better off you'll be. All right. So we cover GPA, we cover SAT and ACT scores. But let's go ahead and go a little bit deeper into what colleges are looking for. All right. So what are colleges looking for? Well, first of all, first of all, colleges are becoming significantly more competitive. All right. So right now on the screen, I am showing a list of institutions and these institutions have different levels of rigor or admissions rate, making them more or less competitive uh, in the context of one versus the other. But if you look at the trends from 2007 to 2022, all of them share the commonality that they have significantly decreased their acceptance rates. All right. So, for example, if we look at Boston University in 2007, acceptance rate was 54 percent. 2022, 14 percent. Brown, 14 percent acceptance rate in 2007, 5 percent acceptance rate in 2022. And now if you get to the really, really top tier competitive institutions like Harvard, Stanford and University of Chicago, you go from a 9.8 acceptance rate in 2007 at Harvard to a 3% in 2022. Stanford went from 10% to 3%. UChicago, 35% to 5.4%. So again, you can see that all of these universities are becoming significantly more competitive. Now, you probably have heard also in the context of what college applications or what college admissions officers sorry, sorry, are looking for, you will see that there are surface level tips or narratives that get drilled and, get, and that get repeated over and over. And some of them have varying levels of truth, uh, but there's a lack of complexity that we're going to go into a little bit later. But basically, you probably have heard some of the following. Colleges want students who have taken as many AP or IB classes as possible or as many dual enrollment classes as possible. You probably also have heard that colleges want students to be involved in this many extracurricular activities as possible. Probably, if not the most popular uh, thing that you hear in the college application process is that, is that colleges want well-rounded students, kind of like the jack of all trades. Or you probably have heard that colleges only care or prioritize extracurriculars done through school, through school organizations or through national organizations. So like the debate club at the school level or NHS at the national level, but through your school's chapter. All right. So I want you to kind of hang these, put them on the, ba on the back burner, and we're going to revisit them in just a little bit. All right. So going back to the acceptance rates and why colleges are becoming more competitiveness, I want to, again, put out as much context as we can so that I can later lay out what colleges truly care about or what they look for the most. Um, but to do that, we need to understand what are the main components of a college application. And a college application is made up of many things, but the main components are your transcripts, which we already covered, uh, GPA, class rank, and the rigor, of course, is taken. We already addressed how we can work with those. They look at standardized test scores, SAT and ACT scores. Colleges look at extracurricular activities. They look at essays. They look at letters of recommendation. And some universities might require interviews. So again. 
Although there are more elements to a college application, those are six of the most important ones or the first things that colleges will look at. All right. Now, I want to share this, um, this, <clears throat> these statistics from Harvard from last year that basically share on the y-axis the GPA of their applicants, of their ex sorry, of their accepted students. So here you can see 4.0 perfect GPA down to 2.0 GPA. And then on the x-axis, you can see a you can see the different test scores. So you can see whether an AC ACT was a 12, an 18, a 30, or a 36. So obviously you are going to see that the majority of admitted students at Harvard are clustered around a 4.0 GPA and a 36 or 1600 SAT score, meaning the top right corner of this graph has the majority of the students, right? So these are, these are accepted students, okay? Now let's look at rejected students. If you look at the rejected student pool, you're going to see that a lot of people who were rejected had a 4.0 GPA, and a lot of the students that were rejected had really high ACT and, S and SAT scores, right? So again, the distribution between the admitted students and the rejected students looks very, very similar. Here's how they look side by side. As you can see, academic components like SAT, ACT, and GPA do share the pattern of the higher they are, so the top right, the more in the top right corner they are, the more that it clusters um, admitted students, but they still look quite similar between the red dots and the green dots. So there has to be a way to break from the noise or to break through the noise so that you can not, so that you can go from being a 4.0 and 36 and 36 ACT student in a red dot to being a 4.0, 36 ACT student in a green dot. All right. So there is more than just the number. So how do you stand out? Well, here's what I wanted to arrive at with all this context. What are colleges looking for the most in a student? or what they want the most, well, colleges want students who are what we call at Best College Aid, the principal student, all right? So colleges want that the statistics that they are seeing on a piece of paper, on an application, on an essay, they want there to be a level of complexity and a, le and, and, and a layer that shows who the student is through these main qualities. First, we have P for passion, R for resilience, those are pretty self-explanatory. Intellectual curiosity, um, often also called as intellectual vitality. And I know that, for example, Stanford uses intellectual vitality as a big component of their evaluation process. Uh, there's also, uh, it means how much the student enjoys learning for the sake of learning. There's networking that kind of measures how the student collaborates with others. Creativity, how much does the student think outside of the box and especially useful for students who are going to be applying in the humanities. Uh, impact, that has everything to do and we're gonna elaborate more on how to demonstrate impact through extracurricular activities. Then we have perspective or cultural intelligence which has to, which has to do with a different and unique viewpoint of the world, whether it is through cultural diversity or through diversity of thought. Altruism, which is another word for social responsibility and the student's understanding of how their actions, their extracurriculars and everything that they do affects society as a whole. And finally, leadership, which pretty much speaks to the ability to influence others and to lead them in or across different uh, ways. Okay, so we're going to be elaborating more on these, but that is or those are the main characteristics um, or personal qualities that colleges look for so that a 4.0 GPA is not just a 4.0 GPA, but if explained properly throughout the application, a principal student will stand out uh, beyond another student who also has a 4.0 GPA, all right? So let's dive in a little bit deeper by revisiting the surface level tips that I talked about earlier. So earlier, I started off with mention, I started off by mentioning some of the commonly accepted college tips that explain a surface level concept uh, but don't really explain the rationale behind it. So the first one was colleges want students who have taken as many AP or IB or dual enrollment class as possible. And while, yeah, taking a bunch of AP classes, especially if you do well in them, is really, really beneficial, the truth behind it or the deeper layer behind it is that colleges want passionate students, so the P4 principle, 
who excel in advanced level courses, especially in the fields that they have intellectual curiosity in. So in other words, do you want to be a doctor? Uh, then are you taking AP Bio and AP Chem and doing well in them? Do you want to be a psychologist? Are you taking AP Psych? Do you want to be an engineer? Are you taking um, AP Stats, AP Calc, AP Calc 2? So how you not just take the surface level tip, but tell a story through it, very, very important. How, that's how you do it with advanced level classes. The next uh, common surface level tip that we hear a lot is colleges want students to be involved in the most extracurricular activities. The reality or the deeper truth behind it is that colleges want students who impact their organizations, their clubs, their extracurriculars through their leadership. And what I mean by impact is beyond just being a member, if your student is in charge of fundraising, how much money did they raise? Or if your student is in charge of recruitment, how much did they uh, go ahead and um, how much did they go ahead and recruit or the percentages in which their college application in or sorry, involvement in the club increase under their recruitment leadership? All right. So the way in which numbers tell a story is very, very important to demonstrate impact uh, and leadership through extracurricular activities. OK, next up. Another surface level tip is colleges want extremely well-rounded students. And this one is one of the most common ones. Um, colleges wanting well-rounded students is something that we hear about a lot. And basically, colleges more than just wanting well-rounded students, they want to build a well-rounded class. So something that goes beyond just the student displaying kind of a jack of all trades type of, 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 of psychology or trade behind them. They want their graduating class to have students who are, again, have good SAT or ACT scores, but who might have a spike in their college application, um, a spike that is represented through their love of music. So they are the expert musician or they are the expert um, test taker who has, again, a perfect SAT or ACT score, or they are the expert engineer or if they're going to be telling the story through the essays of how they want to really incorporate and leverage leverage artificial technology then we talk about personal projects that they've worked on artificial uh, intelligence that display that they are the master of that one characteristic so that if colleges have enough quote-unquote masters of their own areas then they're going to have an overall class that is very, very well-rounded because it's made up of students who make each area of the circle be more extensive and, 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 and very, very diverse with their, with their sort of leadership and with the sort of qualities displayed by their students, all right? So then finally, the last tip or the last surface level tip that we see with colleges, if we can go back to that slide, is that we mentioned that colleges only care about extracurriculars done through their school, when in reality, colleges look at any activity that is done outside of the classroom in which a student displays a sense of social responsibility or in which their actions are more than just, oh, I showed up to this fundraiser, but rather telling a story of, I fundraise for this cause because one day I want to grow up and be a doctor that cures this particular disease, or I am an engineer or I want to be an engineer and I'm in part of the engineering club because my goal is to work at this um, organization to, to I don't know, provide a more environmentally friendly uh, alternatives to transportation or something like that in which an extracurricular is more than just an extracurricular activity, but rather it is a source of, it is a source of narrative points that talk about the student having a sense of social responsibility and how they want to improve the world that they live in. Very, very valuable. And if you can do that while collaborating with other students, super, super valuable, all right? So that is how the principal model uh, relates or coincides or adds an extra layer of narrative points to the traditional tips that you hear about in the college application process, all right? So how do you become a principal student? Well, you become a principal student first by identifying a passion. Everyone has one. Uh, if it's not obvious yet, then it's time it's time to start exploring through different extracurricular activities or through um, and going out of your comfort zone to find what what thing you're passionate about. Could be sports, could be music, could be 
engineering could be playing video games even with all these schools offering now um esports scholarships it could be artificial intelligence it could be programming it could be any area if you haven't found what you're passionate about then it's time to keep on looking and exploring and once you find that area or that specific thing that you're passionate about it's super easy to display resilience because think about when you're studying for a uh, test in a subject that you care about versus one uh, a test in a subject that you don't care about you're definitely going to be way more engaged uh, or way more passionate about learning why you got a question wrong or why you need to understand a certain concept. If you're tr if you're studying for your AP physics exam, if you know that you want to be a physicist or if you don't get a particular summer scholarship or grant or internship in a camp that relates to environmental sciences or an internship in Washington, D.C. If you want to be a politician, it's way easier to display resilience and apply the next semester and talk about that in your college application if it relates to your passion. So it's all connected. All right. Next up, uh, I want to highlight how intellectual curiosity or intellectual vitality is mostly affected by parents at this age um, or at this stage in their student's life. Because think about it, if your student is in middle school or in high school, a lot of the things that they might have interests in um, might require them to feel, number one, supported. So if they care about going to political rallies or they care about um, volunteering at certain organizations, if they have a parent who asks them questions about it, who uh, support them on whatever endeavor that they're doing, then it's easier for them to further delve into that research and to further uh, develop behaviors, healthy, obsessive behaviors in those areas. So those are a little bit of more the deeper psychological ways in which a parent can foster intellectual curiosity. However, there are also really simple kind of obvious ways in which a parent can foster intellectual curiosity, especially at this age with like transportation. If a student wants to join the environmental club or the debate club or whatever it is that they're interested intellectually in pursuing, but they don't have a means to get to that school, then the parent should kind of go out of their way or do whatever is possible or within the realm of possibilities to make sure that the student feels supported so they can foster their intellectual curiosity. Next up, and just to wrap this up uh, regarding principal students, you want to be in situations where you can network with other students. So again, clubs are a great way of doing this. Uh, employment, um, summer jobs, all these things are great ways to collaborate with others. Uh, if you want to go into the humanities, being creative, whether it's through having a YouTube channel, uh, being a musician, whatever the case might be, fostering that creativity is something that can certainly add a level of complexity to your college application. Finally, you want to be in positions where students through these clubs gain different perspectives because this diversity of thought is going to provide part of the well-roundedness of the college class that the that the universities are trying to build with their student population. All right. Last two things uh, regarding becoming a principal student. If you add a, la a layer of altruism or, as I mentioned earlier, how your extracurriculars impact society, then you're doing a great job. And finally, if you are in a club or an organization, don't just be a member, be a leader within that organization, whether it's through an official role or whether that is through the impact of that you have in an organization through your attendance, your fundraising, your anything that displays how you are a leader within that extracurricular. All right. So I know that was a lot to, to take in, but those are kind of the, the house of how a student can become a principal student who becomes way more appealing beyond just uh, GPA or SAT, ACT to colleges, all right? Next up, we are going to move on to something that's related because it's a way to take all those concepts and take them from abstract ideas into concrete proof that you are a principal student. So how do you write a perfect college essay? So to understand some context, um, although this might vary school by school, on average, an essay can make up to 25% of the decision process. Um, and it is one of the few ways in which you can go from just being a face, I mean, sorry, just being a, a set of numbers and a name to being a story and to add some depth to who you are as a character to these college admissions officers who don't know you yet. But by the end of this presentation, you're going to know how to, how to get them to know you. All right, so a weak essay is bad because if you have a great application for a very dull, forgettable, or plain bad essay, you are no longer a strong applicant. And a strong essay, I'm not going to say that if you have a bad application, it's going to all of a sudden make up for everything. But 
a strong essay can take you from being a borderline applicant or candidate to becoming an applicant that gets in before other students with similar statistics or even a little bit better statistics because you are adding that layer of com- that layer of complexity to your persona through this essay, all right? So now that we know that essays are quite important, how do you write a perfect one? Well, you take all those principles that I talked about earlier and you make sure that your essays pass what we call at Best College Aid the principal impact test. So what is a principal impact test? Very, very simple. You are going to ask yourself the following nine questions, right? First of all, does my essay demonstrate a genuine passion for something? Does it show that your student has some sort of healthy obsession with a particular field or a particular uh, concept, something that they want to truly become experts in? And if they can relate that to their college career, if they can relate that to a professor at that college, a program, a class, an internship, something that's very specific to the university you're writing the essay for, absolute best. That is what you want to be doing, all right? Resilience. Are you showing through your essay the way that you overcame a setback or how you overcame failures? Intellectual curiosity or intellectual vitality. Are you showing a love of learning for the sake of love of learning through the experiences that you're sharing in your essay? Networking. Are you collaborate? Are you showing or demonstrating your uh, good collaborations with others? Are you showing uh, for C creativity ways in which you were solving problems with thinking of outside of the box? Impact. Are you demonstrating the influence that you had within an extracurricular or organization in tangible ways? And again, college admissions officers love numbers because they may or may not know the name of this new club that you started uh, at your school. But they will know that a 200% increase in student involvement under your leadership, well, they know what 200% is. Or if you were in charge of fundraising and you fundraised $7,000 in a year, well, even if they they don't know about your club, everyone knows what $7,000 is. So the more that you can get tangible with your numbers, the better. Perseverance. I mean, sorry, perspective or cultural intelligence. Are you showing an understanding and appreciation of how you are different in the ways that you view the world or your upbringing? Are you showing that within your college essay? Next up, altruism. Again, what I talked about earlier, are you showing that your student is committed to to, um, helping the world, leaving it better than you found it? And leadership pretty much just shows how you were able to influence others within your experiences, okay? So now that you've asked yourself all these questions, a test or an essay that that passes the principal impact test has to, has to, has to satisfy passion. That is a non-negotiable thing that you should be displaying throughout all of your essays. Why a particular field of study, area, concept interests you. And then does your essay satisfy at least four other principal qualities um, that are displayed here? So it could be a mixture... It could be a mixture of creativity, impact, intellectual curiosity, resilience. It could be any mixture of other four concepts, but your essay should definitely display passion plus at least four other uh, principal impact tests in order to be a solid, perfect essay, all right? Awesome. So you have a great essay. You have a you have a great essay. You have a great set of um, SAT and ACT scores. You have a good GPA. Everything is going great. You have... Everything is great, but you are still worried about being a red dot instead of a green dot in the Harvard applicant pool, for example. Well, another way to stand out is to get recognized by admissions officers of the schools that you're applying to. So how do you get recognized? Well, we are going to be establishing a relationship with the admissions representative. And for those of you that don't know this, this is quite insightful uh, if you're hearing this for the first time. Many people think that the college admissions process or that the admissions officers who will be reviewing your application are people who can be any of 10 admissions officers, when in reality, they have these uh, these um, officers called regional admissions officers who are in charge of your specific state, of your specific Uh, region. If you're an international student, they could be in charge of your specific country and they will be your first point of contact. Each school might have a different process, but 
Typically, the regional admission officer will be the first person to review your application. They will be reading it for 20 to 25 minutes and they will be reviewing your profile. Now, again, this could be very different depending on the school, but one of three things might happen after this uh, initial review. You can either be fast-tracked for admissions, fast-tracked for rejection. As a matter of fact, uh, around 20% of applications might be rejected after this first reading, or they could be passed on. Your application could be passed on for further review. So it is in your best interest to go ahead and know who this initial contact or initial regional admissions officer who will be evaluating your application for the first time is so that you can prepare for them to read your application and you find their contact information. You can do it in many ways, but what we typically teach our students that best college is to Google the name of the university or the name of the college plus the words and they should be in quotation marks because that, that ensures that they are a uh, require that the Google search returns exactly these words. So name of the university plus regional admissions officer. And after you find who they are, their contact information, their email, their phone number, you want to go ahead and be asking them good questions about the application process, introducing yourself. Uh, you want to see if they will be hosting any school fairs, if they are going to be having any online webinars, if they are going to be hosting any campus visits, uh, or if they're going to be hosting any sort of online um, presence type of, of, of seminar, whatever it is that you can put yourself and your name in front of them uh, in a favorable light you want to be doing because this highlights your enthusiasm. And once they're reading that application, you're not just going to be applicant number 678 with a 3.8 GPA and a 1250 SAT score, but you are going to be Robert or David or whoever it is that you are um, Diego, for example, we see in the comments, you are going to be a person whose application they will be recognizing from that initial point of contact. All right. So, David, if you want to go ahead and share a little bit about your experience regarding um, reaching out to the admissions officer. Yeah. So basically what I did when I was in, in high school, before I even got accepted, I reached out, like Francisco said, to my not guidance counselor, but the admissions rep from every college in my list. I not only did this with the uh, reps at my schools, but I also did it with coaches. I know Laura, who did theater, our sister, who you might have seen in our social media, did it with uh, uh, theater directors because she was in theater. So basically what you want to do is reach out to these people and, and they will help you, again, maximize your odds of acceptance. And then what happened to me was that after I applied to Marist and got accepted into Marist, there you can see my photo at graduation, I went to an accepted student dinner, emailed this admissions rep, and when I needed to appeal my financial aid award, which by the way, we will talk about scholarships and how you can maximize your scholarship packages later in this training, well, this admissions rep helped me maximize my scholarship aid package, package right? So this is something that you can implement and a more advanced strategy that we teach our members inside Best College Aid. But basically, that was my story with the admissions reps and something that we teach our members inside Best College Aid. Uh, but again, we will talk about this later on, so don't go anywhere. And remember that if you have questions, we will answer some questions at the end. I do see you all live in the chat. But that was pretty much it with my story. I don't know. Do you want to add anything to that? No, I think that's that's a, a um a great experience that a lot of our students share. But again, if there's going to be one officer who will be in charge for sure that you is the only person that you know for sure will be uh reading your college application and making a decision, then it's a no brainer to get them to learn your name and learn your story. So this uh, leads us to the next point that I want to share with you all, and now we're going to be moving away from the the whole getting accepted to college and let's say you implement all these strategies, you display your principal student, you elevate the competitiveness of your college application through a good GPA, SAT, ACT scores, all that stuff. Now comes the other part of the battle, which is how do you finance your education? How do you get money to pay for college? So how do you earn the best college aid? Well, let's look at some context. So as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, the cost of college has been increasing, and that's no secret. If you look at private universities, private uh, four-year institutions, 
it's gone from $21,000 in 1993 to almost $40,000 in 2023. Same if you look at public uh, public schools, they've gone from an average of $4,000 to $10,000. All right, two-year colleges from 2000 to almost $4,000. Okay, if you adjust for inflation, you can look at this table. Public four-year colleges have become 2.25 times more expensive in the last 30 years. Private nonprofit four-year colleges have become 1.8 times more expensive. And even two-year public schools have become 1.65 times more expensive. So it's no secret that paying for college is an ever-increasing challenge. That has resulted in a lot of student debt. And you might not be um, a stranger to these statistics. The total student loan debt in the United States as of this year is $1.7 trillion. Uh, average debt per student borrower is approximately $37,000. Average uh, debt per parent is $29,000. Average time to pay off your debt, 20 years. And this has a lot of uh, significant implications in a student's financial health because it delays milestones like getting a house, starting your family, or retiring, all right? So bottom line of this slide... <laughs> Debt is bad and it is a big problem. So how do you avoid it? Well, you put yourself in a position in which you don't need loans. And how do you do that? Well, you want to prioritize college aid. So the best college aid is aid that is received through the colleges. And what I mean by this is if you look at this table provided by the college board, um, by the college board as of 2022, and you look at the breakdown of out of the four types of financial aid and scholarships, state private, institutional, and federal aid, you can look that you can look at how in the last admission cycle, 53% of all financial aid came from institutional grants. So money that came from the university itself, followed by 26% came from the U coming from the US government, 12% coming from private scholarships, and 9% coming from state aid. So what this means is that it is crucial. It is super essential for a student to be applying to generous schools. Not all schools are equally as generous and not all schools are going to be providing the same the same level of financial aid and scholarships. But if you do find those schools, you will be satisfying the largest percentage of your financial need. So applying to a generous school is essential. Okay. And why do some colleges offer more scholarships than other? Well, simply comes down to their endowments, how much money they have for paying professors, how much money they have for structural improvements, but amongst other things, endowment money can be used for scholarships. So some institutions have a larger alumni pool and the more competitive that the university is and the more prestige that it has, the more that it can produce students who eventually go on to make a lot of money and who have more disposable income who can then in return donate it to the school and schools with more donations can offer larger scholarships. And again, if you're a competitive school, you're going to be producing more students who donate. So it's a vicious cycle of the better the school is, the more money you'll have for scholarships, which can attract better students who will create more donations. Okay, so that is why some, and some schools have different levels of endowment, different levels of money that they have available for scholarships. And again, as I mentioned, there are different uh, sources for this. It can be alumni donations. It can also be Gener ge uh, revenue generating activities such as sports teams or investments that the university does, uh, or it can be government funding. Government funding is money that is allotted by the usually the state, uh, the states to give to the universities, and all of these money will go on to fulfill different um, scholarships and give opportunities to students to go at to generous institutions. So the whole point here is. Because we know that not all schools are equally as generous, but generous schools satisfy the largest percentage of your financial need, you want to apply to the schools that are generous. Okay, you Probably the biggest thing that we teach inside our uh, best college aid is finding schools that not only satisfy your academic necessities and what you want to study and your passions, but that they're also compatible with your de level of demonstrated needs so that they can satisfy the percentage of demonstrated financial uh, need that your family has to the highest extent and you don't have to take out loans and you can avoid a lifetime of debt. So if you take anything away from this presentation is that take away the fact that schools are different, have different levels of generosity and you want to apply to the most generous ones. All right.
So that leads me to once you do all of this, I do want to go ahead and leave you with the most actionable step that you can take today because a lot of the steps that I've talked about today have to do with what you do when you are a senior applying for scholarships or taking the SAT or ACT or even selecting institutional uh, universities who are generous at the institutional level. But I want to leave you off before we go into the final tail end Q&A session of this presentation. I want to leave you with this secret on how to find the easiest scholarships to win. And for this, I want to again remind you that there are four main types of uh, financial aid and scholarships. There's federal scholarships, um, which are provided by the U.S. government, state scholarships that are provided by the states. And again, U.S. government provides around $89 billion uh, for students. State scholarships are $13 billion. University scholarships are $60 billion. And private scholarships for private corporations, the Coca-Colas, the McDonald's, the all those private entities of the world that provide your scholarships that you more traditionally think of when you're applying to college provide $12 billion. So they make up a very small percentage of um, the awards given out to students nationwide. However, part of this is because students don't know the best practices to apply for them. So in a way, there is a larger area of opportunity here. So how do you capitalize and how do you find the ones that are the easiest to obtain? Well, you look for institution. You look for private scholarships that are very niche, very local, and very specific. So, although national private scholarships, again the Coca Colas, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation scholarships, the Burger King scholarships, are great, and it's an absolute blessing if you don't have to worry about paying for any tuition at all. That's wonderful. However, competition is really, really, really tough. There are thousands of applicants every year. And it's very, very selective. Sometimes some of these scholarships are even more selective than the colleges who will be getting accepted to. So what we teach our students is that you will supplement your institutional aid and your federal aid. And if you qualify for state aid, you will supplement that with institutional awards that might not be as big, but that are less competitive. So you want to look for local, smaller scholarships and apply to a bunch of them. Where do you find them? Well, the easiest one to find, the easiest way to find these scholarships is first go to your high school college counselor because they might have a list of pre-vetted scholarships that have already been proven to work because students at the same high school that you attend might have received them in previous years. Um, they might also have at least a list of scholarships that are not open to the public through search engines. Uh, you can also go to you, either yours or your parents' employer. They might have through their, those organizations, they might have scholarships. Um, you can go to your community, and I mean this through religious centers, community foundations, and local businesses. They might have uh, scholarships that they use for whatever purposes that they want to give a scholarship for, altruistic reasons, tax reasons, whatever the case might be. You want to go ahead and exhaust all resources within your community. Then local chapters of national organizations, if you are a Boy Scout or a Girl Scout, um, and there might be specific scholarships for the chapter within your county or within your area, within your state, within your local government. The more specific and small you can get, the less competition there will be and the more likely you are to receive those scholarships. As a matter of fact, I, following the strategy for my freshman year of college, I didn't have to worry about getting a meal plan or worry about food because through my high school college counselor who sent out an email blast, uh, sharing uh, this scholarship done. Even though it was a national scholarship from Comcast, they had already pre-vetted and it was one of their local distributions um, meant for students within our area. And someone at my school had already gone it the year before. So I was recommended to apply. I applied for it, didn't have to worry about it. And again, it all came because I followed one of these four sources or places to look for private scholarships. I know David also has experience with private scholarships that he can go ahead and share. Yeah, so basically what happened to me was that I applied to a local relocation scholarship. I, we had just moved counties when I was um, in high school. And yeah, like Francisco said, our uh, high school college counselor, if you're lucky enough to even have a high school college counselor at, at your school, you utilize them. They are great. They might be a little overwhelmed with the amount of students that they have to help. We'll talk about that later. 
But yeah, she helped me apply, find the scholarship. She told me to apply. I applied and I won $2,000 uh, from this local private scholarship. And local private scholarships, like Francisco said, are less competitive than national scholarships. So apply to them. Um, you will have much higher, much higher odds of accept uh, of getting uh, the scholarship than you will if you are applying to the national scholarships. But as always, make sure that your application is complete. And, and yes, if you do win these types of scholarships, you can reduce the amount of loans that you end up taking. You can also reduce um, your the cost of your meal plan, housing, and this will not affect your institutional aid. Uh, which is exactly what Francisco mentioned and what we teach our members inside Best College Aid. All right, great, great, great. So <clears throat> with that being said, I do want to go ahead and share. Uh, that was the seventh tip that we had prepared for this presentation, but we do have an extra tip or secret or something that we recommend everyone to do. And that is, this is applicable to the college application process, but it can be applicable to any type of, type of skill or concept that you want to learn and that is to always rely on someone who's already done it or someone who's going who's gone through the process or is a coach or an expert or someone again who provides guidance in a structured manner uh, a professional counselor we used one um, all the members inside best college aid have access to to us who provide that service to them but basically students currently have two options either their high school counselor who in a perfect world would have all the resources and the accessibility to provide one-on-one -on -one guidance to every single student at their high school for free. Unfortunately, the national average is 500 students per one uh, counselor. So the math doesn't add up for them to be able to sit one-on-one -on -one and provide that guidance. And then the other side of the spectrum is private college counselors who provide great quality service and a lot of uh, insight and a lot of experience and can be great mentors, but who unfortunately charge thousands of dollars for these services. Uh, I believe the national the, the average is between six to eight thousand dollars for these services. So those are the two options that that exist to date and that is precisely why we do the content that we do on social media, why we do the trains that we're doing right now and that is also precisely why for those of students who are interested in learning beyond this presentation, which hopefully was a lot of value to you we we worked. Uh, over the last few weeks to come up with this training and hopefully you learned a lot of, 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 of valuable resources and tips. But for those of you who are interested in a more comprehensive or in a more detailed um, guidance, we do have what is the Best College Aid Family Lifetime Membership that David can talk to you all a little bit more about. Yes, so our Lifetime Membership, our Best College Aid Membership includes Tons of benefits that I will go over now, like access to our lifetime uh, course. Our best college aid course includes um, courses on what you can do starting in middle school all the way till you are in college. If you join best college aid, you'll get access to all these courses and the new material that is added and updated whenever needed and sometimes even monthly. Is also something that include that is included. For example, there will be some changes in the FAFSA starting this year, and something that you will have to continue to implement if you uh, you know renew your FAFSA every year. The lessons will be updated. Uh, the course will be you know new material will be added, and you will have access to that as well. Another benefit that it's included inside the Best College Aid membership is access to our private Facebook community for members. We're over a thousand families. Uh, ask questions and interact with each other and where we give support, right? We give support through other channels as well. We have access, to, you will have access to our email if you join. I know that some of the members here are already watching this live stream. Uh, you are already a member, so you clearly have access to our email. Uh, you can ask us questions through this Facebook group, through the live chat, and obviously through the uh, Zooms that I will talk more about in depth later on. So that is another benefit of joining Best College Aid. The value of uh, the online courses um, is valued at over $2,000. The private uh, community is valued at over $500. The SAT and ACT official study accounts that you will have access to, like uh, ACT Prep Plus, we have a partnership with Kaplan, who is the official collaborator for the ACT. Our members get one, act, one account for free with their best college aid membership. And we also teach them how to 
uh, access uh, an official SAT prep account. You will have access to that as well. That is valued at over $500 as well. Our members also get access to a 30% off discount on the entire RIA store. And if you don't know who RIA is, let me pull up uh, the material. I use these exact books. Uh, we use these exact books when we were in high school. We have more. But uh, we basically, our members get 30% off uh, these AP Crash Course books uh, that we used when we were in high school that they use now to pass their AP exams. And this, on, uh, as well as the ACT Prep Plus and SAT accounts, can help you maximize your odds of not just winning uh, acad not, not, not just getting accepted, but also winning academic scholarships of up to $20,000 per year. When we say that some of our members members have won full ride scholarships, well, a lot of them earn eighty, seventy thousand dollars scholarships, and guess what? Uh, a big chunk of that money comes from merit based academic scholarships. So you have access to this thirty percent discount, and another one of our partners on top of uh, Kaplan, who is the one that gave us the uh, free ACT Prep Plus, Ria.com. Another one of our partners is. Dell, right? So Dell Technologies partner up with Best College Aid. And with this partnership, our members get access to an exclusive landing page where you can access this uh, website, this link, and you will get access to hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of this of discounts for um, equipment, computers, electronic devices. And this can be used uh, whether you are in middle school, high school, already in college, or even you, mom and dad, watching this. So that's another benefit that Francisco managed to get uh, us and our best college aid members. members. And uh, lastly, I did talk about this in more depth. I don't know if you want to talk about this uh, new initiative that we started doing. Yeah, so <clears throat> in 2023, we started doing monthly Q&A sessions with our members because we are aware that every case and every family is going through a different situation. So in an effort to make sure that there is accountability from both sides, from the students and from ourselves. And there is some sort of upkeeping and maintenance and, and, and monitoring and tracking of every student situation. Parents and students are welcome to join our monthly Q&A sessions where David and I are live. And as a matter of fact, next Monday, we're going to have um, our sessions for our members in which we hop on a Zoom call and we stay on for one and a half hours in Spanish, one and a half hours in English. And we take in any questions, any special circumstance in case that they want to uh, kind of bounce back with us. We go ahead and address it on those monthly Q&A sessions. They're very, very valuable because they are your point of contact. Number one, where you can, as a member, ask questions that you have, but also learn from questions you didn't even know that you had. So very, very valuable. We do that the last Monday of every month. Yes. And these Q&As where you uh, get like Francisco said, the chance to ask us questions. You will never be alone in this process and we'll all be, always be there uh, for you. I know that the course is great. It has helped a lot of people get uh, 20, 200, 300 times the amount of what we charge, which we'll talk about the cost next. But we know that every situation is different, that you will have questions. And that's why we offer this new bonus that it's included. It's worth thousands of dollars, but we are including it uh, for free inside our Best College Aid membership. And with that being said, let's talk about the price. If you go to our website, you will see that the price of Best College Aid is uh, $997. However, because you are here and you joined us live, uh, the price to join Best College Aid is a one-time payment of $497 or three monthly payment plans of uh, 197 All right, so that is a 50% discount if you do a one-time payment and a little bit over that if you do it in, in three months. But to access this discount, if you are interested in joining today and getting access to all these benefits now, all you have to do is go to, and this is depending on whether you are watching the link in our, or if you're watching this video on YouTube, you will click on the video's description. If you are on the phone, simply tap on the title. I think this zoomed out again. One second. I'll zoom out so that you can see. Yeah, so click on the title. This should open up. If you're on the computer, uh, you should already see it. And you'll click on the des video's description. It will take you to this link. If you're on Facebook, Laura will uh, share 
the link with you on Facebook, but it is also on top of this video. There you can see Francisco and Laura, who is uh, helping us moderate the chat. The live stream discount will be available for the next four days till uh, Friday. So that's five days? Yeah, till Friday at midnight. Uh, whether you're watching this on the replay, that is on the 28th of July. And... Here you can see a video of what is included in the in the course in the membership. Uh, you will get to see also more uh, bonuses, the benefits, you know, detailed. If you want to take a moment and look at them, testimonials. Francisco had this interview with Emma and her father Chris. Uh, she won over eighty thousand dollars for Northwestern, and how many in total? I think it was one point two five million dollars across Georgetown, UNC Chapel Hill, Duke University. So bunch of top tier institutions that she got accepted to i think if you had a lot added all up it was around 1.25 million and she opted for northwestern where she will be getting financial aid package of eighty thousand dollars across all four years so yeah that is far. yeah yeah no uh, a return of investment uh that goes over 100 to 1 and, and yeah you can just see more testimonials and once you are ready to join click the get access now button that will take you to our checkout page where, uh, as you can see, it's a secured checkout page. Um, you can see that we offer a 14-day money-back guarantee. So if you're not satisfied with our material, contact us. We'll refund your money. Uh, we don't want to sell you anything that you don't need. And I'm sure that the value that you will receive will help you get much more than what it costs to join, like Victor, who earned $78,000 for Emory University. And, um, well, I just had an interview with him the other day. And he was super grateful for everything that he learned. So enter your name. Uh, if you want uh, your email, this will take you to the payment information. And I will just do an example email right now uh, so that you can see how to join Best College Aid and get access to all this today. And if you're watching on TikTok or Instagram, go ahead and you can go on YouTube at Best College Aid USA and see this video in the video description that we are sharing that um that discount all right so yeah as you can see now we have the one uh, payment option of 497 that's 50 percent off or we also have a three monthly payment plan of 197 uh so yeah we can you can pay with paypal one of the most secured uh, forms of payments uh, offered uh currently you can also use google pay uh, credit card debit card and once you join you will get access to this immediately yeah so well, um, before we get to answer any questions, one thing that I always like to 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 talk about when it comes to the best college aid is number one, as I mentioned earlier, there are two alternatives: free high school counselors who don't have, unfortunately, the means to meet with everyone and give them personalized quality support, and private college counselors that can charge up to ten thousand dollars for their services, average between six and eight thousand dollars. So this is a fraction of the price for more quality because it's the same information but on demand you don't have to wait to meet in person but rather we can work everything through our platform through different points of contact and then number two is um every a lot of um or we can you can wonder well can't i find this information by myself online and one thing that i want to think of is i want you to think of is with anything that you are thinking of purchasing or buying any service or product um you can make the argument again whether you are someone who wants to get into sports for your child you want them to be a soccer player a swimmer or you want them to play an instrument and you get them a coach um yeah in theory they could learn everything by themselves but sometimes either a they don't know what they don't know there are the unknowns unknowns so you don't even know what to look for if you're going through this process so uh you're getting the peace of mind of knowing that there's a proven methodology that our students have already been following to find great success so that you're aware and you are conscious that you're not missing anything. Uh, and then another thing that you, I want you to know is that you have two options in front of you. What do you value more, your time or your money? And if you really think about all the time that you will be saving by knowing exactly the methodology step-by-step -step that you have to follow that is pre-planned for you through the best college aid, through the years of learning and the thousands of students uh, that you don't really have to worry about spending any more time than you have to while making sure that everything that you have to be doing gets done. And as David already mentioned, it's fractional investment because it is an investment um, that with the benefits alone, with the Dell discounts, the waivers that you can learn to access through um, your high school for SAT or SAT scores if you qualify, 
um, the discounts with um, RIA and certainly the scholarships and award packages that you'll be receiving. It's an investment that will pay by itself tenfold. Um, so that's something that I want you to, to keep in mind before we go into uh, the end of this presentation or before we sign off. Uh, I really do appreciate everyone who's been attentive, who's been watching us, who, again, we worked hard on this presentation, so hopefully you got a lot of value out of it and hopefully you learned uh, something that you didn't know going into it. And if you are interested in becoming part of the best college aid family, then the link is in the video description and Laura already put it in the comments. Yes, it's on Facebook and on YouTube. You have to go to the video description. Uh, we do answer. We did we answer the couple questions that we had here. Um, I see. I see. There's uh, one or two that have not been answered. So, Sarish, while the offer is running, see let's... while the offer is running, Sarish asked, uh, "Should I do both the SAT and ACT, or uh, if not, which one's more important?" They're, they're interchangeable or they're valued the same. There's not one that is valued more than the other. Um, what I do recommend and what we teach our students is try each one of them at least once. Look at the percentiles of how they rank compared to the national average. The one you feel more comfortable and do better at the first try, stick to that one and study it. Yes. And if you're already a member of Best College Shade, remember to activate your study material. Start practicing. If you're a freshman, Take the PSAT. That's another bonus that we will talk more about in depth inside the course. So I know that some of you are already members. Um, and, and yeah, if you have any questions, email it to us. You have our emails. We will have a Q&A, like we mentioned, for members only on next Monday. So make sure you tune in. I'll email you with the details uh, later. And that is a great question. Uh, thank you so much. One last question before we finish the live stream. And this presentation is from Diego. Uh, considering admission officers spent a short amount of time on each application, how do I know if my application is too complex? Great question. You want to take this one? Yeah. So the numbers, again, GPA, SAT, ACT, when we said early in the presentation that they're going to be reading or evaluating your application 20 to 25 minutes, well, those statistics, those numbers are just a glance, easy to look at. So that won't take much of their time. So those 20 to 25 minutes will really be thoroughly looking at your essay. So even though it sounds like a short amount of time for someone to be evaluating your application, especially considering how much time and investment and many years of preparation you've been putting for this moment, um, that is why it's important to... I remember one of the things that my English teacher told me back when I was in high school and my college professors uh, elaborated on, it's very difficult and it takes a lot of time to make something sound simple and to make something sound like it's not difficult. So your concern here is if you don't want to sound too complex, that's why you have teachers proofread your essays. And that's why you want to make sure that there's no uh, grammatical errors so that if you're really talking about one thing that you're passionate about or you're displaying the principal student concepts because it's been proofread enough and because it's concise and because it's to the point those 25 minutes are plenty for them to really get an understanding of who you are, especially because you're following the principal methodology that you are very clear with how you're displaying your passions, how you're displaying your leadership. You want to make it as simple for them to really get to know you so that they don't think that it's too complex because you've worked hard enough to make it look simple. Right. And always it's good to be a specialist, you know, specialize in something that way they know you're that person. Uh, and they get a, a sense of who you know within those 25 minutes if that happens to be one of the schools that quickly looks at applicants. So stand out, super important. And and yeah, that was uh, the last question that we'll answer for today. Uh, we will send you the replay and uh, this discount will be available till Friday at midnight. All right, so um, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for, have, uh, for sticking around and yeah, have a good one. Appreciate it. I'll see you all later. Take care.